As we've done each week when we cannot be together physically, we light this blue candle, bringing the spirit of all of the, those of you who are out there listening in, into this room so that we might feel at least spiritually connected. And now I invite you to use that order of worship to join in singing hymn number 10, one that frankly I want at my own memorial service, Immortal Love, by John Greenleaf Whittier. Now it's time for our unison chalice lighting. The words are printed in your order of service so that you can follow along. We light this chalice for the light of truth, the warmth of love, and the fire of commitment. We light this symbol of our faith as we gather together. I mentioned that in the weeks ahead, there are quite a number of activities going on. There's an opportunity, for example, to join in small group ministry. Today would be a good day to sign up for it. I'm going to be conducting the minister's book club this month, which is discussing Adam Gopnik's brilliant book, A Thousand Small Sanities, 
the moral adventure of liberalism. That will be on the 21st and 22nd of July this month. The Sensible Sim Cinema is doing a virtual screening of American Factory on the 16th. And I think I'm gonna join on Wednesday with our intern minister, Megan McGuire, uh, with a Wednesday wander at 3 p.m. where we'll join by Zoom and then do some wandering and report in. The Pagan Interest Group on the 24th will have its full moon ceremony time to draw down the moon. And our meditation ministries on, uh, on Thursday and Friday, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays, uh, led by Elena Perez, uh, include a morning meta meditation and an equanimity practice. There's a gathering of the black indigenous people of color in the congregation on the first Sunday of the month, uh, each month, including August and a journey toward wholeness racial equity task force meeting taking place uh, uh, the last Tuesday of both this month and next. There's an opportunity also to participate in the All Face Food Pantry that takes place each Saturday here in our neighborhood at Old Fir First Presbyterian Church. And I think that in concludes the invitations that are relevant this morning and we may now center ourselves for worship with a meditation on breathing. Uh, if you've not done this before, just listen to our song leaders and join in when you feel comfortable. When I breathe in, I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in I'll, I'll breathe in, in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out I'll, I'll breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in I'll, I'll breathe in, in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out I'll, I'll breathe, breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, when I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, when I breathe out, I breathe, out, I breathe out. Love. love is the spirit of this church and service is its prayer. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in freedom and to help one another. Recognizing that there is suffering all across this planet in the course of natural or human-made disasters, we include in our worship a ritual of remembrance and commitment. It is now almost exactly two years since we began doing this, 
first moved by the needless death of seven children in detention, supposedly in the custodianship of our government. And so we've rung our gong seven times for them, and through the pandemic, added one more for all of the suffering that has gone on through denial and the inequities that go with the distribution of needed medical care everywhere. We've reached the milestone this month of four million people known to have died of this disease across the planet. Our hearts break for all those who have lost loved ones for all those who have been ill, for all those who have continuing symptoms of the, of the disease, and our hearts break for how often we have broken our faith with the people who come knocking on our door, seeking only safety and hospitality and refuge. I invite you now into a spirit of meditation and prayer as we remember them. May this remembrance allow us to use our moral imagination this week, each of us to find some small way of lessening the tide of suffering, if only through a simple recognition and act of kindness. So may it be. Amen. Fire can be a cleansing thing. It just seems so final at the time. It was Christmas Day, 1985, and I was on my way home from the Fisherman's Wharf to my SRO hotel after a successful day of clowning. At the time, I wasn't my usual Poindexter the Clown persona. Instead, I had created a character called Ribbo the Clown for a restaurant on the wharf, Bobby Rubino's Place for Ribs. My bosses were awesome. They got me a helium tank, balloons, and a makeup table for painting kids' faces. As I made my way down O'Farrell Street towards my place, I became aware of fire engines. The closer to home I got, the more certain I was that there was a fire. It must be right across from my building. But alas, no, as I made my way through, I could see the reality. Fire was voraciously consuming the top two floors of my hotel, and I lived on the top floor. All I could think about were two things, my cat Felix and all my writings from over the years. I began to cry there on the street when a camera crew spotted a clown in distress and put their lenses and lights on me, asking me what was wrong. I explained about my cat and all my possessions going up in smoke. They filmed me and then let me go. I ran up to a friend's apartment and washed my clown face off, then made my way back to the scene. By now it was a five alarm fire and more press were present. Diane Feinstein was the mayor at the time and she came down. It was a tragic Christmas Day fire, displacing a hundred residents. As I approached the scene again, two friends told me they'd found my cat and he was alive. What? It seemed impossible. They told me that they had found Felix in the bathroom of a Red Cross van. She'd screamed before she realized it was just a very wet, smoky cat. At the van, they handed Felix out the window to me and the press picking up on it started filming again. So my cat and I were the feel-good silver lining of a tragic time. At least most of my clown gear was safe at Bobby Rubino's. I still have my job and my cat, and the Red Cross put us up in other hotels. Of all the stuff that I lost, and most of it was just stuff, 
like one collects. My writings were the one loss, but my memories did not go with them. A few weeks later, whilst clowning again at the wharf, two shy children came up and gave me a handmade Christmas card. Inside was $60 and a hand-drawn pictures with these words, Dear Clown, we are sorry that your house burnt. The picture showed a house in flames with a clown leaning out the window crying, Help! Help! The father explained to me that the children had seen me on TV and were sad and worried for me. They wanted to return some of their gifts so they could give me some money. It was just the sweetest thing. Those kids made me see that I had lost a lot of stuff, but I was still here, able to create, to love, and to be loved. Join me now in a spirit of meditation and prayer. Spirit of life and love, most of us are not good at letting go, at relinquishment, at submission before the realities of loss which come through life. The spirituality of so many traditions tells us that we must learn to do these things. Not always easy. 
things we may let go of. But those who have loved us and whom we have loved, oh, that is far, far harder. So if in this time of worship and memory and hope, we remember those who have loved us and whom we have lost, help us to remember also how great a blessing is human loving and that not to have known and loved at all would have been lost far greater still. For our hope lies always in our gratitude for the blessings that we could still rely on and pass on. And so give us the faith and strength and courage to do so. These things and more, now in silence we would ponder as we pray. And as it is in the meditations of our hearts when we are most at one with ourselves, with our best selves, with one another, and with that shared source of life and love that sustains us all, so may it be also in our words and deeds. The offering for the works and ministries of this congregation will now be gratefully received. You'll find the donate button on the website. We are grateful for your generosity.
This poem is by Elizabeth Bishop. It's called One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day. Accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch. And look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a jester I love. I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster.
It was a bit over a decade ago now, I think, when I first began to ponder the spirituality of relinquishment. I was nearing retirement age and beginning to wonder what that would be like. But the greatest precipitant was feeling that I wanted to sell the house. We were then in a four-bedroom place in the Boston suburbs, and I felt fatigued by all of the maintenance. Housing prices had gone up, and so I wanted to downsize and move to an apartment. My wife Gwen was very reluctant, and I could understand that. Letting go of home is one of the harder things, and we'd both learned that pretty early in life. My family moved 10 times before I was 16 and went off to Italy as an exchange student. Gwen went to five different high schools in four different countries. But when we did make that move, we did have to winnow our belongings. Like many people, we had found that our possessions had almost come to possess us. The worst of it was that between the two of us, clergy, we had accumulated 8,000 books. Half of them clearly had to go. So I went over the shelves with her, inquiring of each volume, do you have any more to say to us? Are either of us likely to open you again? Some we gave to ministerial students, a book dealer took some others, and we donated about 2,000 to the friends of the local library. So that nine years ago when we moved out here to California and the movers told us that every book would cost us about a buck to move across the country, we relinquished another half of them, among other possessions. Gwen made it easy that time. She said, oh, well, after all, who's ever seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it? Better practice now. And I remembered visiting Gandhi's ashram in Ahmedabad in India and being shown the loincloth, the glasses, the bowl, and the spinning wheel that were his four possessions at the end of his life. Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out on the road, take nothing with you. The Buddha did likewise. But this kind of spiritual discipline takes time to master. The art of losing, quips Bishop, isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. And that may be true about mere things, but the other losses, she mentions, are harder. Home, places, cities, memories, plans, and finally, the unnamed you with the joking voice, the gesture I love. Recently, the New York Times carried a close analysis of that very poem. Bishop evidently put it through dozens of drafts. The precipitating event was the loss of a love. The younger woman with whom she had been living had upped and left her, and that did feel like disaster. Ultimately, she dealt with this devastating loss by using a highly controlled poetic form, the villanelle, the only one she ever wrote that consists of six tercets, the opening line being repeated somewhere in each, plus a final line. Though it may look like it, write it like disaster. Losing loved ones, as I said in my prayer this morning, in my personal and pastoral experience is by far the hardest form of loss. All lose parents, of course, soon or late. For Gwen, it was soon. She'd already lost her father before we married, and during our third year of marriage, her mother also died, and the next year, her only sibling, her brother. The loss of children, of course, is even worse. Gwen and I, thank God, never went through that except a miscarriage, which was a grief, in which an anticipated attachment was mitigated by something beyond our control, to which the spiritual duty was simply an act of submission, which none of us do well. So don't get either of us going about why women should be 
not be allowed to let go of a pregnancy if it is unwanted and when that seems the appropriate relinquishment. Yet there are harder issues of, in families about letting go. Recently, I've been writing the history of this congregation. And among many stories of constructive impact on society and politics, there are also, of course, stories of loss. The most poignant involves a woman who served here as church moderator 50 years ago. She had joined the church in the 1950s. She was married to a professor of psychiatry. The mother of four, she was an activist against nuclear war and racial discrimination and many other injustices. During those years, by the way, this was the fastest growing urban church in our denomination. By 1967, it had 350 children in the church school and 1,050 adult members. Margaret, the woman of whom I'm mentioning, was by then a leader in the denomination as a whole, its vice moderator, the first woman to step in to preside over a general assembly when the then moderator, a congressman, couldn't be present. And after her, by the way, for the next 60 years, all of the chief lay officers of the denomination were women. Yet talk about loss. Her eldest son, an artist, 24, two outstanding one-man shows to his credit, was killed by a car. His brother then had a schizophrenic break, committed violence, and went to prison and died there. Their sister, perhaps suffering survivor guilt, took her own life. Yet through all of this, to my amazement, Margaret had the support of this congregation and its minister, Harry Schofield, who was a brilliant pastoral psychologist who knew plenty of loss himself. He was raised at an orphanage. And he felt immense guilt when, when he was 10, his younger brother in the same institution drowned one summer. The chaplain of the school or orphanage helped him. And when he became a minister himself, Harry put himself through a full training in psychoanalysis so that he could more deeply accept loss and be present to others in working it through. He adopted a rigorous spiritual practice called living by heart that involved welcoming each day as precious and pondering what he could do that would be of worth within it. It was he who helped Margaret through all of her losses. And I now pause to give thanks for my own therapist, Dr. Harold Fine, trained by the same institution in Philadelphia that trained Harry, who taught me that I could not do the grief work for anyone else, including my wife, that I could just be there fully. All through our lives, if we are wisely supported, we can learn to grow in the spiritual discipline of relinquishment. Without the security of family or church community, however, it's harder. I've several times ministered to people who are so poor at it that they become hoarders, afraid of losing even last week's newspapers so that they become buried in what they can't relinquish. And I don't judge them. I only empathize with that level of anxiety. When Gwen and I were first preparing for ministry, we had the blessing of learning from a great professor of pastoral theology, a Dutch Jesuit named Henry Nouwen. You'd love him, Dennis, because like you, he was attracted to the circus. A great metaphor for life, he'd say. Three rings always going on at once. The political circus over here, the economic circus over there, and the more abstract cultural creative circus. Perhaps best expressed by artists, musicians, poets, and clergy and clowns. Thanks to your self-reflection, Dennis, I now know your persona as 
Poindexter sort of rose from the ashes when you seemed to have lost everything, before you found that you had not lost Felix, your aptly named cat. It reminds me of what Henry Nouwen tried to teach both Gwen and me. He became part of a religious community called L'Arche, devoted to embracing those with cognitive and other profound disabilities. But to prepare for that, which meant letting go of a great many things, he decided to enroll at circus camp, not as a clown, but to take training on the high trapeze of all things. Was the hard part learning to let go? He was, of course, asked. Oh no, Henry would reply. That came easy. The hard part was learning to trust that I would be caught. Let me repeat that. The hardest part was learning to trust that I would be caught and held. Now by who or what, you may ask, and I can't answer that for you. As our opening hymn put it, perhaps all of the images and symbols of the divine have faded for you. But since our sense of self is so much tied up with our memories, our accumulated experiences and senses of mastery over the world, I came close to basing this sermon on a popular poem by contemporary poet Billy Collins. Maybe you remember it. The, the name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel, which suddenly becomes one you've never read, never even heard of. Those were the novels I gave away. As if one by one, the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. It's all quite true and amusing, but in my experience also a bit glib. Every day at my age, I relinquish another memory, another name, and tell myself that it's not about my retrieval mechanism going bad, it's just that over the years I've acquired too much information up there. Yet this too is disingenuous. Memories do drift off, often if they're not much needed. For our sense of ourselves consists more of, our, of more than our memories, more of our memories than even of our bodies. Which is why I think we are wise in our tradition to prefer memorial services to traditional funerals focused on mere bodily remains. In Jewish spirituality, you know, toward the end of one life, one discipline is to compose an ethical will about conveying not possessions and treasure to the next generation, but some sense of one's indebtedness and unfulfilled ideas and transcendent hopes. Lately, I've been lamenting how many of my oldest and dearest friends, particularly in the ministry, have died while I have watched others sadly be unwilling to give up control, privilege, and the paradigms that they once held as critical in the struggle against injustice. A few even resigned from connection with the rest of us, rather than work with us on the dismantling of the culture of white supremacy. But that's a different topic, one that I'll take up in discussing Gopnik's book about a thousand small sanities, which defends liberal democracy not as an ideology, but as a persistent practice, almost a spirituality that resists both the fascists of right-wing po populism and the rigidities of the radical left, 
while always listening to all justifiable discontent and disconnection. So here's my final comment and prayer for us all with regard to relinquishment. That we remember that we are all just anxious beings. We fear loss of all those things to which we have attached our mortal lives. Growth in spiritual relinquishment must be a prayerful and continual practice of relinquishing privilege, relinquishing control, praying for faith and trust. And so you unnamed, you love that never lets us go, guide us toward simpler ways of living, toward greater relinquishment, self-giving, and trust. May we have the faith to let go of ego and time and treasure, asking only for help in knowing that when we are most afraid, love eternal still abides within us, between us, beyond us. May we keep that faith when all else goes. Amen. going. May that love that will not let us go guide us, grant us peace, and shine out also from within us. For these are the days that we are given to live. Let us forever rejoice and be glad in them. Amen. <laughs>